But getting women into the judiciary was another matter. In 1925, have, have any of you seen this picture before? No? Uh, in 1925, we had a very unusual situ situation occur in Texas. We had a Supreme Court with three members on it. Now we have nine members on our Supreme Court, but at that time there were three members. They were all male, of course. And they, um, they, a case was coming up from El Paso called the, well, it involved the Woodsmen of the World. The Woodsmen of the World was a fraternal organization like lions or elk or something like that. And this case was coming from El Paso to the Supreme Court and seeking to be reviewed in the Supreme Court. And the trouble was all three men on the Supreme Court had to recuse themselves because they were all members of this organization. And the issue at hand invo involved um, an outcome that would benefit the organization they were a part of. That organization sold insurance and in this case it had some land that it had put into something called special trusts. They were secret trusts, as a matter of fact. And I'm not going to get into the whole case or anything, but in any event, Woodsmen of the World was seeking uh, a different result, and they would benefit from this. And so every member of the uh, organization would also benefit by extension. So. They all recused themselves and told Governor Pat Neff that uh, we can't hear this case. You're going to need to appoint a special Supreme Court to hear this case, this one case. Well, for the next 10 months, the governor was looking for male judges and male lawyers who would accept the appointment to this case. Well, Woodsman of the World was a very prominent, political, politically connected organization and every judge and nearly every lawyer in Texas was a member of this organization. It was a good thing to be a part of uh, for, for them, for their connections that, and, and the networking they could do. So 10 months later, he finally started looking for women lawyers. Now you saw the statistics. There aren't very many women lawyers on the, uh, available. But he found three. It wasn't these three. Um, well, it wasn't. It, two, of those, two of those three weren't the original ones, but it turned out that eventually these three got appointed to take the case. And so this was in 1925, the first time that women had been on the bench of a Supreme Court, I think anywhere in the country, because the, it made the headlines in the New York Times when this occurred. And um, they w took the case uh, and had it argued and made a decision. It took about five months. So for five months, we had this parallel special Supreme Court that was hearing this one case, while the men who are on the Supreme Court heard all of the rest of the docket. And um, what I think is kind of interesting about uh, this is that this comes, he, Pat Neff appoints these three women just on the eve, really, of when the first woman is getting ready to be sworn in as governor of Texas. In fact, we've only had one. No, we've had two women governors of Texas. But, um, but Ma Ferguson was about to take the oath of office the next month. So here we have women sitting on the Supreme Court and a woman governor at the same time. And it was, um, it was really out there as far as almost everybody could imagine. Um, but the woman in the middle, her name was Hortense Sparks Ward. And she started out as a court reporter. And I tell you that only because a lot of times women find their way to law and to judgeships uh, by doing other things first. And she started out as a court reporter and then became a lawyer after she married a judge. I don't know what that had to do with it, but I imagine it had quite a bit. And, um, and she happens to be the first woman who was who, to pass the state bar exam in 1910. I was referring to getting women uh, licensed the, in 1910. She was the first one. And uh, she was the first woman also who was admitted from Texas to practice before the Supreme Court of Texas. Well, I'll go on to the next thing. Here's another woman, and I'm talking about this woman right here. She's got her back to you. 
But I think you've all seen that photograph, haven't you? Pretty famous photograph from history when uh, Jackie Onassis is watching the uh, next pre president of the United States, our own President Johnson being sworn in as president after her husband has been killed. Well, the woman that swore him in was Sarah Hughes. And Sarah Hughes was the first woman who became a district judge in Texas, a state district judge. At this point, in 1961, she has been elevated to become the first woman in Texas who is a federal judge. Um, so she is a fascinating woman to study. And um, at, there's a whole library of stuff on her at North Texas um, University, State University. So um, I find her very inspiring also. So how did I get to be a judge? Well, I started out as a teacher and found these women that inspired me and so forth and was lucky enough to marry a man who would support me to do this and go off on this. Because when we first moved to Seguin, John uh, was uh, taking over a new position at Texas Lutheran in the art department and had to reorganize the art department for several years during that time. And I immediately applied to law school and we had a 10-year-old daughter. So not only was he working full time, but he was also primary parent the whole time I was in law school uh, so that I could fo focus, focus totally on my, on my work. Uh, so I uh, went to law school and became a lawyer and um, spent 17 or 18 years as a lawyer before I became a judge. And at one point, I decided I wanted to be a judge. I'd had that first inkling when I, even before I went to law school, but I followed it through. The first time I ran for office, I lost the election. I just want you to know that because you can fail, you can fall. On your, down on your knees and you can just get up again and do it again and chase your dreams and don't let it ever stop you if that happens to you. Um, so I was running that second time about four years later and um, I was lucky enough to be elected in 2003. And so when I ran for judge, I'm, I'm, uh, we run for four-year terms. Uh, I've had two more elections, <coughs> another election since then that I had a contested election. And I'm on the ballot this year too, but I'm unopposed. It's the best way to run. <laughs> but, but um, th so that's four elections I've been through. And I thought you might like to know a little bit about how that happens. Uh, campaigns are really tough. They're uh, long. They start about 18 months before, um, before you get before you, uh, before election time. And I had a note here I wanted to find. I've got it out of order, I guess. Here it is. You know, when you're running for office, um, you put in a full day of work, whatever you're doing. Uh, whether you're elected yet or not. But if you are elected, you are on the bench all day long and tied down to those kinds of things. And then afterwards, you're, you're, you're campaigning for several hours. And I want to share this with you and, and bring out the crying towel a little bit because I know all of you are sick of seeing all those campaign ads on television, ad nauseum and so forth, and can you put up with it and so forth. But, you know, when I see... Uh, uh, another candidate, I just give them a big hug because I know what they're going through. It takes nerve and it takes an awful lot of stamina to run and you've got to be slightly insane uh, to do all this. But we'll often attend three or four events after, after five o'clock running all over the county before we get home to, to have some supper and sit down and put our feet up. So it's, a, it's an exhausting thing. Um, campaigns include Fundraising, having to ask for money is a hard thing to do. Nobody, everybody hates that the most. Um, it also involves going to every meet and greet you can find. Uh, there are candidate forums where you and your opponent get up and talk about how each of you are wonderful and why you'd be the best candidate. And sometimes you accuse <coughs> the other one of being the worst candidate and sometimes you don't. It kind of depends on, on who, who that is. 
I'm inundated with voter guide requests and questionnaires all the time and we've got to just constantly be at night when we get home at 8 or 9 o'clock filling those out because they get published. And some of these voter guides are really good things. They can really help you kind of read the background and the uh, experience of people. And I, I encourage you to look for them, particularly the League of Women Voters, which is nonpartisan. And there are a number of others, too. And so they're usually designed to give you some information to prepare you to make choices in the ballot box. But some of them are single issue questionnaires. And you always have to be careful about those because they're geared towards a, a skewed result, what, no matter what side of the question you're on. Um, they will be misleading and dangerous in many ways. And they tend to reduce the candidate to simplistic points of a litmus test. Think about that, a litmus test. I've been to a number of events where the litmus test was the question of, uh, are you for abortion or against it? You know, things like that. Uh, one of the most outrageous uh, questionnaires I received, this was four years ago, was question number one. Do you believe in legislating laws from the bench? Or, in other words, making up your own laws? What kind of a rude question is that? <laughs> no. Um, and the second one was, to stop judicial tyranny, do you agree to change any laws, to change any laws from going against the Constitution to agreeing with the Constitution, thereby fulfilling your oath? What a trap of a question that is. I mean, it isn't even, um, it doesn't even make a lot of sense. So we get all of those a lot too, and some of those I just ignore. There's no point in bringing, taking that on. But we run into these, it's, it's the dist, one of the distasteful sides of, of the campaign trail. Um, so that's, that's kind of what we do. We, advertising on TV, you see a lot, of the, um, a lot of the ads I think are helpful, at least I can put a face to a name, and the ballot is so long. Have any of you voted? this year? Oh, great! <laughs> uh, when I think how long it took set women 72 years to win the right to vote. 72 years of struggle. Remember the ladies. Remember the ladies, Abigail Adams said, and it was 72 years later. Uh, but you know, in 2004, those statistics I recently saw, 20 million women in the United States didn't vote in the 2004 election. And 15 million of them weren't even registered to vote. And when I think about the women that struggled to win that right for us, I think, oh, you know. So, what do I see of you from the bench? Well, I do bench trials. Bench trials means that the judge decides the issues uh, and, and issues a verdict. or. I do jury trials. Right now I'm in the middle of a two-week jury trial on a medical malpractice case involving a woman who had a broken ankle and went to the ER and it got worse. And all I know at this point is I don't want to ever break my ankle. Really, you don't want to do that because there's a lot of bad stuff that can happen to you that affects you the rest of your life. Um, we also hear business disputes, uh, real estate disputes, personal injury disputes, medical malpractice, child custody and divorce <coughs> litigation, parental termination and adoptions. Adoptions are my absolute favorite thing. Oh, I love to do adoptions. They're so much fun. Um, and so I think what you can see from that is, is I don't do criminal law. In Bear County, we divide up the courts into criminal, civil, and juvenile. And we each just stay in our own little area. And so I am in the specialty of, of civil disputes. We see lots of angry and hurt people every day seeking justice. And the most important thing in seeking justice is that we give them a chance to be heard. Sometimes it is very cathartic, it's very therapeutic just to be heard. And if that can be done, then however the dispute is decided, um, people s tend to be able to move on and, and get on with their life and not just chew on this forever. <coughs> Some people are stuck in it forever. 